And we're live. Hey, good Monday, everybody. Happy beginning of the week. Hey, welcome. Welcome to the AMA with uh, me. I'm Scott Jernigan. And I'm Dave Rush. And it looks like the uh, the police have left. So I can <laughs> do this. Get out of the witness protection program. There you go. Yeah, I know. My audio is live again. All right. Hold on. All right. Fixed. Got it. Okay. All right. So, hey, welcome to the Ask Mike Anything show starring Scott. Not Mike. And yeah, not Mike and not Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Scott Jernigan. I'm editor in chief for Total Seminars. I work closely with Mike Myers and have for a couple of decades. Uh, I am his editor and frequent contributor and even co-author on uh, all of his books and uh, an instructor in my own right and an author in my own right as well. So that's me. My colleague here is... I am Dave Rush, and I do uh, cleanup work at Total Seminars when the offices are open, empty the trash cans, right, clean out the coffee pots. <laughs> and on occasion, I get to instruct classes face-to-face -face, uh, online and I uh, get to help out Mike and Scott with things like these. When I'm not doing that, I curate uh, many of the online forums that we do, and uh, I write stuff that gets rejected all the time from Scott, but he has somebody rewrite it and turn it into something. Hey, the man's born with a red pen. <laughs> uh, that is that is me with the mighty red pen. You guys all here today. Good, good looking crowd, the usuals. Yeah, very much so. So uh, Mike Myers, a little update on him. He has finished his swing through the Northwest and Western United States. Uh, I think he's doing the last hug and kiss with his grandchildren today and headed on the road for the long haul from Denver to Houston, Texas, which is, if you know anything about Texas, that's a <laughs> very, very long drive. Um, so he will be with us. Uh, I think he'll actually be back in Houston tomorrow and definitely on air on Wednesday, barring some unforeseen whatever. Um, so he sends his regrets not being here today, but he is with us in spirit. And if he's at some rest stop that has Wi-Fi, who knows, he may even log in. So we'll see. Yeah, it was really exciting to hear from him last night. We've been conversing with him all morning and getting ready for his Wednesday show. We're excited that he's back. He's excited to be back. He misses you guys. So it's really good news. This is kind of bittersweet for Scott and I, certainly for I. Uh, I've really enjoyed filling in his, his time here, but uh, I'm so looking forward to hearing his stories. I know he's going to have great stuff from his travels. And uh, I've seen some of his uh, feature plans for things he wants to talk about uh, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, there's some really, really good stuff. You're going to like it. Most definitely. So the purpose of these Ask Mike Anything shows uh, that Mike started several months ago is for those of us who are stuck at home quarantining or social distancing heavily from colleagues at work or, or school and studying for the CompTIA plus certification, Network Plus, Security Plus, or any other kind of IT certification thing that you would have a place to come and ask questions of the supposed experts. So um, <laughs> that's what you need to do. Just ask us questions and we will answer them. If we can't answer them quickly, we have a whole team of people hiding behind the curtain who uh, will feed us answers if need be. Um, and between Dave and I, we've got a lot of years of uh, a lot IT experience and can answer many questions. Well, we, it's an ask me anything, right? So anything goes, we'd like to keep politics and religion out of it for the most part, um, but anything else is fine. We are comfortable with our wheelhouse of CompTIA certifications, IT fundamentals, A plus, Net plus, Security plus, Cybersecurity Analyst plus, Pentest plus, et cetera. Um, but we can venture a field as it, as it may be. Um, like Matt said, if we don't know the answer, we really enjoy finding this kind of stuff. That's true. In fact, we, we, we encourage you that even if we don't have an answer immediately or say, simply throw our, up our hands and go, I don't know, <laughs> email the question to us. We really and truly love this stuff. And researching your technical problems helps us increase our skills. And then we get to share them with you as well. So it's, it's a win-win all the way around. So you can contact us. Uh, here's our 
contact information, uh, Mike Myers, Michael M at totalsim.com. And give uh, him Dave, the advantage of that while he's been gone, Scott, uh, in a conversation I had with him today and yesterday, um, he's got a pile of topics that have come up and he's got some very consistent ones. He's going to base, uh, I think his first feature program on one that he's gotten a bunch of messages that by coincidence are on uh, same topic. So keep writing him. He's, he loves this stuff and it, it triggers him in a positive way to, uh, to do some really good things for everybody. That's awesome. So yeah, Michael M at totalsim.com. Um, you can contact Dave at Dave R at totalsim.com or Dave put his personal email up as well, drushtx at yahoo.com. And mine, you'll be seeing a pattern here, is scottj at totalsim.com. We're also gamers. You can catch us on Steam playing a, an assortment of um, games. <laughs> Mike is Senior Pepe. Um, Oops. Dave is Blood Rush TX, and I'm Scarheart. So look us up on Steam if you're a gamer and want to play. Um, finally, you can, if you're on any kind of social media and, and think maybe Mike might be on that social media, he's not on Facebook, just about every place else though. His catch-all nickname is Des Weds, and he'll tell you all about what that means on Wednesday. <laughs> just ask him. So you can also get a hold of us by phone, although that takes a little more doing. Our, our office number is 281-922-4166. Uh, it'll get no one's at the office right now, um, or at least we try and minimize our contact. Um, but our answering folks will get that messages to us and we can call you back at your convenience or ours. As long as you're talking about slide things, I figured I'd just throw this up. Well, okay then. <laughs> so one of the things that our marketing people have done just because they love you as much as we do is make special deals that are only for you. The special deal today is for this entire week is 50% off on, on all of the A plus and network plus super bundles. Those are the videos, practice tests, and simulation products for A plus and network plus and security plus video and total tester bundle. This is a great deal, 50% off. Just use MMLive831 at checkout at totalsem.com. Also, if you're a teacher trying to hold non-live classes or socially distanced classes and need some help, um, contact Kathy Yale at totalsem uh, Kathy, y, Kathy Y at totalsim.com. She has some great deals for you. I mean, like great deals for you. So check it out. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, you mentioned that uh, people write us, ask us questions. We research them or sometimes we'll get them on the uh, uh, YouTube chat feed. And uh, if we can't answer them then and there, uh, we take them. I've copied and pasted a few of them. And as we go through today, I've, I've got a few to answer. So that's going to be cool. Okay. Meantime, awesome. let's see who's here. All right. Up some screens. Goodness, it's rolling and boiling. Yeah, it oh. is. Oh my gosh. Tullowit was in first. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't see Brendan. So something's wrong. We, he's coming. He's coming. Trust we better me. send a, uh, a welfare <laughs> check. What do they call those? Something along those lines. Hello, Taco Taco. Welcome. Everything is good in Hawaii. That's never a question, Taco Taco. The answer is yeah, obvious. It's Hawaii, the place we <laughs> all aspire me. to go to. So his 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 island is on lockdown, is what he's. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so I wish that our island of Houston could be on lockdown too, but mm. unfortunately, yeah. well, it's such a divisive thing, isn't it? Yep. So Alan Dugan is here. Elbow is here. Excellent. I've got to say hi. Make sure I can. Say what? I got to do a hello. So I'm. Oh, so yeah, people can talk to you. Yeah. And I saw Brendan as I was typing that in. Greetings, Elbow. Nice to see you back. Alan's here. Marvin's here. Really? You're not going to do all four names? <laughs> I promised not to two sessions ago. So 
<laughs> yeah, but it is a lot of fun. Brendan, my friend, good morning, everyone. Whoa, Brendan, good luck. No kidding. Oh, that's right. He mentioned this the other day that he was going to do yeah. this. So. Good luck. Any advice? Be yourself. Be neat. Be clean. Be well-spoken. Eye contact. Say, I don't know if you don't know. Yeah, you got this, man. Yeah, don't try to bamboozle anybody. They're there interviewing you, asking you questions because they already know most of the answers. The only ones they don't know are the ones about you. Right. Uh, hopefully you've done your homework and you know insightful questions to ask about their company. Right. And if you haven't, I suggest you get off right now and, <laughs> <laughs> and do some do some homework. Uh, <laughs> but I'm assuming you've already done that. So there we go. Andre Andre de you know, you can't. I'm oh, sorry. Andre de Guria is here from the Netherlands. Hello. You know, I, can't, <laughs> I can't see you say SEC plus without seeing Andre's name. <laughs> Uh, Hello, Andre. Uh, it's all good. We're going to have to learn uh, some greetings in some other languages that we're not already functional in. So true. I've got I've got Spanish, French. You got uh, Spanish from here in yeah. Texas? That's so cool. Right. Yeah, well, that's our problem. We've got all of the the Euro Romance languages: French, German, English. Okay, German, Italian. Is Italian. I got a smattering of Japanese. German's not a romance language. Well, <laughs> I know what you mean. I don't have much in the Nordic languages. I always tried to, when I was traveling back and forth from the Middle East, Yeah, I never you know, knew much in advance where I was going to stop in Europe. Um, and if it was a, a country that I was already familiar with and I knew I could uh, at least hi and bye and thank you to the uh, counter staff, uh, but if I'm going to stop in Amsterdam or something like that, you could sure bet that I'm brushing up on all of the basics, at least before I landed. And right. that kind of stuff, that's what gets you in first class or gets you first in line to, to get bumped. Is, and it's respectful. Absolutely. And it's, it's, also, it's also important to like get your cultures right. So <laughs> when I, when I, <laughs> I made the mistake, because I'm not, not fluent in Spanish, but I'm, I can get by, um, certainly in Mexican Spanish and border Spanish. Um, I grew up in San Diego and El Paso mainly. So yeah, Spanish was kind of a necessity. So I went to, went to Europe and went to Spain and was like, oh, this is great. I'm, I'm in Barcelona and I just did what I do in any Spanish speaking country. I just spoke Spanish and got really hostile responses in English. And I was like, what is happening here? Why, why are people talking to me in English when I'm doing the right thing and speaking in Spanish? It took me a, a little bit of research that night to figure out that I should have been doing those greetings in Catalan instead of Spanish. Ah. <laughs> so yeah, it's important to get all these kind of things down. I have so heard from many, many crowd. people. I've heard from many people in this area uh, who pick up Spanish from uh, South America, Central America, Mexico, and when they try to use it in Spain, it never goes over well. Yeah, it's very different. So, hello, Andy STL. So, okay, good. I got your question out of the way the other day. Man, Excellent. if you guys missed the pie show the other day, it, it was a big piece. Two weeks ago, we did how to install a Kodi server. This Friday, we did how to install a Plex server. And those of you who were there this week, and it went okay. Man, where do you see what I've done with it since? Oh my gosh, I have good things to talk about. Uh, this coming Friday, we're going to integrate the two of them. I'm look so looking forward to this show. It is so frighteningly simple. I did it on the weekend while I was doing some stuff. Just and I was, oh well, shoot, I need a whole hour's worth of presentation to add on now because it's about two minutes to do it and ten minutes to talk about it. Well, okay, but more of course. It's going to so, be good stuff. Catch all right, so. Question. Before we get started on on the questions from the crew out here, yeah. I have a question from Friday's show. All so right. Friday, Friday, you went through how to install and set up and configure a media server on the Raspberry Pi, which is a Linux box. I did. And using the Plex server. And when we were going through it, and, and right at the very end, looking at the, the video feed, it was choppy. And I, I questioned it at the time, and certainly offline, I questioned it because uh, I was not expecting it to be that choppy. And, and 
what I understand is that you were using a Pi 3B. That's true. So did you have a chance to use an upgraded Pi? <laughs> and oh, that sounds like any a difference? question. Yes, I did. So I'm glad you asked that question. Let me see. Yes, uh, you, you forgot uh, one of the words to start with Q, but yes, I've got it. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I did some more experimenting with it. First of all, as, as I told everybody going into it, I am not a Plex guru. I wasn't when I started this. I am now functional in it enough to get one installed and things like that. But uh, And I learned a lot more this weekend. But quite right. So I used a 3B. Uh, many, 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 many people have reported using a 3B. But then, of course, the same number of people reported installing Kodi on an A when it first came out. And it was horrible, but it installed. So this weekend, Micro Center had a sale. <laughs> I mean, you bought another pie? Another pie, you ask? She's going to divorce you. You realize that, right? She was with me because <laughs> the sale was really funky. Two gig model pies. I know it looks like every other box, but it says two gig somewhere on there. Uh, we're on sale for 30 bucks a piece. Wow. One only. So if oh, you bought two, the they were 35 bucks a piece. If you bought three or whatever it was, it was 60 bucks a piece. Something, some insane ramp up like that. Right. It's because they don't want any uh, resellers coming in and buying out their stock or multiples. Sure. So the missus and I went down and here, get one, I'll get one. And oh yeah, Raspberry four gig models uh, were on sale for 45. So I came home with three model fours, a pair of two gigs. And I've got a, a handful of, three or four of them uh, sitting in boxes that I use occasionally and no. So, all right, well, let's go see what happens. So this was really cool. This was a double experiment, something that I've never really done. I, I know you can do it. I know everybody does it, but I took one of the SanDisk cards that I use to install Plex and Raspbian OS, Raspberry Pi OS, uh, and just popped it into a four gig with, I'm sorry, a four B with two gigs. Now think of the difference. The 4B compared to a 3B has two more, or another gig of RAM. He's got two gigs. He's got dual outlets. He's uh, dual monitor connections. He's got a faster CPU. Uh, a, well, they don't talk about this. There's a, a better video driver for it and better, 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 better. So I was expecting an improvement. And of course, that card that I used was the high performance SanDisk uh, Ultra Micro SD. Right. So I plugged it in and it was like watching television. Oh my gosh, I was knocked out. Then I carried the experiment a tad further. I had my regular monitor here in front of me that I, yeah, I'm touching. Uh, and I did a VNC remote connection to it at the same time and watched the same movie on it. And watching it on the monitor in front of me was like watching TV and watching it on the VNC server was jumpy. It, it obviously drops frames. Okay. So that's where all that was coming from. And then I think by the time we passed that through the YouTube feed, uh, it was more like a slideshow than a movie. Okay. All right. So that works that's awesome. freaking great. And as a result, for anything that's performance or video oriented in all subsequent projects, they're going on fours. I've still okay. got a project coming on threes. Uh, in fact, I got one that I'm going to do next weekend on a zero. Those of you paying attention, we're going to finish up integrating uh, the servers this week on Friday. And then next week, at the specific request of our Lord and Master, Mr. Mike Myers himself, we're doing a pie hole because Mike wants to do a pie hole. <laughs> About time. No, that's awesome. That, that killed a ton of time, but thanks. Yeah, so it, man, it's just wonderful. Every time they, and you know what? When the five comes out, it's going to be even better. And I'm going to say the fours are junk. <laughs> <laughs> Most excellent. Thanks. And I totally interrupted us at like two o'clock. <laughs> it was a worthwhile. <laughs> so, uh, Jao is here from Portugal. Hey, good to see you. Okay. Cindy Anste is here. Hi. I'm watching this conversation between Tulloit and, and Brendan. <laughs> Very true. I need to remember that. And it's not the end if they don't choose me. Don't plan for that failure, Brendan. It's the <laughs> end for everybody else that they don't choose for you. The beginning of a wonderful new world. <laughs> All right. So Elbow has, of course, the pertinent question here at 202. What's the gizmo? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
you know, I, I did that a half an hour before the show started or so. I went up and looked at all the, the props I have in my studio. And uh, this one doesn't show up very well in the light, but you'll all recognize it. And I get any power off that. Uh, it's one of those plasma glow bulbs. And if you were here and you saw my finger, it would be really pretty, but the sunlight shining on it and going yeah, to the yeah. camera. Eh. But there it is, Gizmo Central. <laughs> so, Gizmo Central through interpretive dance. Yeah, that's right. I should have brought sock puppets down. There you go. Because that went over so well in that Mike Myers video. <laughs> if Let's you haven't seen that, guys, go check out the rest AMA, of So I can make fun of. Yep. Okay, if, if you haven't seen Sock Puppet Mike Myers, just look through the YouTube channel before we started doing all the AMA stuff. It's on there. And it's a joy. So tell me <laughs> what you're right. Yeah. So even though we got a bittersweet loss of filling in for Mike, we've always got Pi Day Fridays. That's right. Absolutely. So the same crew is the guy behind the curtain, Scott and Dave are Oz. <laughs> <laughs> We're a little better than Oz, but uh, yeah. Now we did. We definitely have people behind us. Ian is probably going to pop in here at some point. Just we're going to make some comment, and he'll be like unable to stop punning. <laughs> Enable, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the big, the big. The, do this. <laughs> I'm going there. I'm going there. So no. when we talk about something being secure in IT, right? We're talking about a secure connection or a a secure protocol. How do we describe what isn't secure? Do we call it an insecure protocol, an unsecure protocol, a non-secure protocol, or a protocol that's not secure? And don't forget a secure, which I'm pushing. <laughs> and so yeah, believe it or not, that was a 30 minute conversation this morning. So there you go. Between yeah, five of us. And we're even literary, ge literary geeks, so. Things that really matter in the world. <laughs> That's right. An oh. elbow at the very end of the chat that you won't get to for a minute. It says dissecure. Yeah, there you go. I, I, I came up with the de desecuritized. Oh, God. <laughs> Lord, heaven help me. <laughs> oh. Taylor Brooke is here. Hi. Yeah, I see some see you. people. Again. Oh. What is this? This AMA crew is becoming like Cheers. Everybody knows your pseudonym. Ah, <laughs> nice. That's true. Yeah. Um, who's the gent we have from India whose name is totally different? We'll find it. He pops in. Deepak. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think what his his moniker is on here. Health. Health. Uh... Help desk. No. Yeah. Health. Oh yeah. Something health. Yeah. Okay. We'll see him in a bit, I, I assume. Uh, <laughs> never, Elbow. I will never have to worry about saying, okay, Google in my home, ain't no got. So mine is all just like Alexa and my entire house lights up. Because unlike Dave and unlike Mike Myers, I love the internet of things and I surround my entire life with it. And it's awesome. I don't care if Jeff Bezos knows what I'm listening to. It's okay. He went I to the same the grade school as my children did. Therefore, he must be cool. Right? I, I, I'm sorry. Please. Go ahead. I, uh, what I want and, and what we have, in fact, is going to be an answer to one of the questions earlier uh, that got emailed or got posted earlier is uh, a central control box that doesn't phone home. And that's a wonderful thing. And big surprise, I can do it. Um, there are people who propose that there are boxes that would provide a better solution. Uh, and I'll get into a little bit of that as we answer on, but okay, it was Alexa's not phoning home and Google's not phoning and phoning home. And I can talk to it and say, Hey, central box, increase lighting by 60%. Hey, central box, show me what's on my camera doorbell. I love that idea. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears and I'm sure everybody else is too. So yeah, if you got a solution that doesn't, involve completely invading our privacy that would be, be nice even i could probably embrace that just just saying <laughs> so here's a great question and, and we researched this a while back and there's a, a key answer to it that's escaping me maybe you'll remember but christina barat uh, bandari says which one is good 
I'm going to assume the question means which one is better, but I'll get back to that. Sure. Uh, RAID 1.0 or RAID 01. And so let's mention those things. Okay. So RAID with those two digit things gets called 10, 1, 0, 1 plus 0, and 0, 1 goes by 0, 1 or 0 plus 1. Right. We should promulgate OT1 from now on. <laughs> I like it. So on the surface, they appear to be functionally the same. So both of them require four drives. Uh, and I go, I get them confused. I'm, yeah, right, two and two. So if I read my notes in advance before this class, I would remember which one was 10 and which one was one zero. But one of them has a pair of mirrored drives over here on one connector of the controller and another pair of mirrored drives over here. So let's make them uh, nice round numbers they are 50 gig drives. So since these are mirrored, I got a total of 50 gigs worth of storage on this pair. Right. If they're mirrored, there's another total of 50 gigs. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to span them. Stripe them. RAID zero. Stripe them. These are gonna be, yeah. Okay, nonetheless, the effect is the same. So I'm gonna make an additive quality of these things so that half the data goes on here and the other half goes on here and it gets striped, it's block striped. So one block of data goes on this mirrored pair and another block of data goes on this mirrored pair. And okay, cool. <clears throat> we'll come back now because we're gonna look at the failure mode. It's all about the failure mode that makes one better or not as good as the other. So the other works just the opposite. We're going to take a pair of RAID 1 drives, span, sorry, uh, RAID zeros. So I'm gonna stripe some data across this pair of 50 gig drives. And that means I'm gonna get hundred gigs worth of storage. Over here, I'm gonna take another pair of same size drives and I'm gonna mirror this pair to this pair. So this becomes the redundant setup. So it looks the same thing. We both get hundred gigs of drive. What about failure modes? Well, let's look at our first situation. I've got my mirrored pair here. I've got a mirrored pair here and they're striped. So let's say one of them fails. I had to be very conscious about which finger I was gonna drop there. <laughs> I almost dropped the wrong one. Okay, so this fails. That's going to put this array, this subarray out of, uh, I got mirrors and they're striped. So we're still gonna work here. We're gonna pick up half of a block or we're gonna pick up a block from here and we're gonna pick up a block from here. So the recovery on this one is to replace this dead drive and just tell the, the RAID controller I've done that. And in the background, he'll take care of all the remirroring and restriping and things like that. Now what happens if I lost this drive here and I lose one of these drives? Hey, good news. I'm still functional. This was a mirror and this was a mirror. So I still got a mirror of the block here and a mirror of the block here. So we can tolerate a double disk failure in this configuration, RAID 10 or RAID 01. Uh, we're gonna lose some performance, but big deal, we're functional. And again, yank out those old bad drives, pop in a couple of replacement drives and the RAID controller will take care of getting them all brought back up to speed and back to sync. So what can't I do? Well, I can't lose two drives on one side at the same time, because now I've lost half of the striped data. So that's no good. Right. And I can't, of course, lose any three drives, because again, I've lost a pair off of one side. And as soon as you lose a pair off of one side, you're DOA. Now the other way around. Striped blocks, striped blocks, and they're mirrored. So I can lose a, uh, a drive here because I've got the complete mirror of what was over there, over here. And in the same way, these are exactly the same thing. They're both mirrors. So I can lose that. I can lose one of the drives on this side. They're a mirrored pair. Uh, they're a, I'm already losing track of myself. Doesn't matter, you get the idea. I, you can lose one drive on either side. How about losing two drives on either side, on a single side. Yes, you can do that because this is your striped data. This was a mirrored set of that data. 
So I just lost the mirror. I am still totally functional. Right. So I can lose any two drives in this system, including two drives from the same side. And for that reason, if there is a better one, a more resilient one, that's the configuration that you would prefer, all of the things being equal. And you probably looked up which one was one zero and which one was zero one. So it matters, yes, I did. So it, the, the first number is what matters when you're thinking of the, of the how the RAID 10 versus one plus zero works. So RAID 10 has one as the first answer. So the, the, the pairs are mirrors, RAID one. The z that are then striped, so zero, one plus zero. With RAID one, zero plus one, you have two stripes that are mirrored, right? And I know my hands are moving the same way. It doesn't <laughs> matter, okay? <laughs> Get it. So RAID 10 is a, a stripe of mirrors. RAID zero plus one is a mirror of striped pairs. Okay. And the other techno gobble term for this whole nonsense is nested arrays. Right, nested array. Cool, excellent Very question, Christ, uh, Christine, Christina, there we go. So Cindy has a question. Web servers, this is at 208. Um, if you don't know, you can click the, the three kind of the uh, vertical ellipses uh, in the chat and turn on the timestamp. So we're gonna always be a little behind where you guys are asking questions. So if you wanna see specifically the questions we're asking or answering, uh, addressing, then I, I'm gonna tell the time stamp as well and you can turn that on. So at 208, Cindy asks, web servers. Okay, all right, she asked a real question too. How do people feel about a hosted, hosted domain such as GoDaddy versus DigitalOcean versus AWS LightSail or Azure equivalent when it comes to security and server side maintenance? That's a, it's a, it's an interesting question because you're asking us uh, a poll, a survey question. You're asking us how people feel. And I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that in the company, we use traditional hosted domains. I use traditional hosted domains for my personal stuff and my that's, high that's business right. stuff. Um, I use the same security that anybody would use if they were hosting on Azure or AWS. Um, if, if I needed, I use uh, CloudFront. It's obviously easier to integrate on an AWS system than on a third party like SoftLayer or uh, my host is uh, Fat Cow up in Maine. Fat Cow. Fat Cow. Yeah, Maybe, you know, it works. I've been running on that website for almost seven years now. Wow. Uh, I've, I've been DDNS in the past, but it wasn't personal all of Fat Cow got nailed. So they were the ones who uh, fired up Cloudflare and solved the problem. Cool, okay. I can't speak for how other people feel, but uh, I feel whatever you're most comfortable with is what you use. Maybe what you can afford. If I could afford AWS all the time, maybe, but. So here's another, Cindy had another follow-up question, not follow-up question, but a totally different question. Okay. Um, at 209, what is a clever database to try and build for practice that would be purposeful? Well, there's an unfair one, huh? Yeah. Let's say that there are two databases in the world, Access, and a SQL. simple non-sequential database, and then all the SQL databases that are effectively the same. Uh, uh, SQL from Oracle, Maria, the knockoff on that, uh, SQLite, that knockoff. So there's no right answer here. It's, it's what do you want to do? If a flat database works for, with you, for you, cool. We use Access Database and track thousands upon thousands upon thousands of our practice test questions. They all get incorporated or are generated within our access database. And then depending on what we wanna do with them, we export them in different formats and maybe massage them a little bit so that they can go up on Udemy or go up on the other platforms on which we do this. Uh, our database for our web servers and our, our online web apps, like the, uh, the online Total Tester and Total Sims, 
and things like that. That's sequential, it's SQL. So it's good to know them both. Yeah, but the uh, <laughs> I had to I had to write database stuff and and do um, I and I wish I wish Michael was actually on this call because he his his degrees are actually in database development. Uh, so he's more on the back. Pardon me? pardon me. I'll ping him on the back channel. Okay. So if Michael comes on and uh, might, might be able to say a few words on database stuff, if you were there for the AMA when it was he and he and I, uh, or him and me, him and me, uh, yeah, he, he, he'll geek out on us hard. But so just be prepared if he jumps on the call <laughs> that, yeah, it could go deep, but he'll have a better answer for which database he would prefer or which he thinks that a student should tackle first. Right. I'm going to make a note that that's the question at 209 from Cindy if he comes on. Okay. So TK, hello. U.S. Health Insurance Reform. Hi. There we go. Deepak. Andrew Hutz is here, of course. Excellent. And my scroll just jumped like crazy. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, get, I, didn't, I never know what I tell people about what I don't. I know this has come up peripherally. So most everybody knows that uh, I, I'm a retired or resigned airline pilot. And uh, after 9-11, most of the airlines went bankrupt. And I was a low seniority captain at the time and uh, just wasn't able to stomach <laughs> uh, becoming a senior FO again. There's benefits, but the pay was not among them. So I picked up a job over in uh, Saudi, uh, flying over there for a couple of years. And the deal was, in theory, on paper, 10 weeks on and three weeks off. Uh, that never really happened. Uh, we need you to stay another week or two. We will give you uh, an extra fill in the blank large amount of money here. Uh, but always coming home, it was never a, a straight shot. There was a couple of straight shots, but they weren't worth it. So usually went through someplace in Europe. So uh, I did two years uh, living in Saudi Arabia, flying for a Ramco. Excellent. So did you pick up any greetings in Arabic? Of course I did. Excellent. I, you, I did the, the thing that you always do when you learn a new language, you learn the seven dirty words first. <laughs> I can swear and, in more languages than I can do anything else in. And then, hello, goodbye, thank you. I learned four things in both languages first. Hello, goodbye, thank you, you're welcome. And uh, how to order a beer and how to find the restroom. Except in Saudi, there's no alcohol allowed. So I never had to learn how to order a beer. <laughs> That's at least five things, just for yeah, those of no, I missed it when it was... As I was counting up. <laughs> Math, come on. <laughs> and you learn to count. That's always kind of fun. That's you true. know, we always learn here in the States that uh, it's the Arabic numbering system. So I always kind of figured that the numbers would be the same. Couldn't be more wrong. Really? Yep. Okay. Another day, another time. Michael is going to join us. At, uh, I see him on the back channel. Okay, excellent. TK. I'm having trouble installing sys internals on the newest uh, on, on the newest PowerShell. I can't use the install package name sys internal. The error says can't found the package. So good. We have two questions for Michael. Because <laughs> he's much more the PowerShell user than you or I. This is true. This is very true. All right. So Michael is Michael is popping in here. So we shall see him shortly. Yeah. And those of you who do not know who Michael is, uh, his name is Michael Smyre. His job title is, yes, um, <laughs> it's actually officially a developer. He is, he is the guy who runs all of our internal uh, systems. Um, so he's our primary systems engineer. Uh, he's a serious programmer and database developer. He designed total, the total tester practice tests. Uh, he, he and another programmer designed the, uh, the hub training site that all of our stuff runs on. And I assume he'll change his name from meeting admin to Michael Smyre here shortly. <laughs> but then he would have to change it back when he does his normal Zoomy things. <laughs> How he does it on Michael. Michael. Hello, hey, Michael, nice to have you. So Michael, two questions have come up that uh, are right down your alley of expertises. Oh no, okay. Uh, I don't know if you're gonna follow along in the, in the, uh, the chat here, but I'm gonna give it to you at time mark 208. Uh, Cindy Anstey, whoops, a little farther down than that, she did the follow-up. 
209. She asked the question, what's a clever database to try and build for practice that would be purposeful? And we kind of suggested that there are effectively two categories of databases, flat ones like Microsoft Access and a SQL. And that uh, is really well, no, well, Microsoft Access is a SQL database. It is a full relational database. Yeah. There you go. Um, just, just as that minor. A uh, flat one would literally be like text files, uh, structured text files. That would be a flat database. Okay. Um, uh, purposeful? I mean, if you have something you want to keep track of, it has relational data in it. That would be a pur purposeful database. Um, sure. I mean, I guess the first database that I ever experimented with was keeping track of my library of books. Yeah. And just, you know, I had to, I, when I moved, I had to box them up into little things. I'm like, okay, I'm going to lose where all these things are. And I want to be able to find my favorite comfort novel when I move into my new house. And so I, I created a database of books. Do you remember what you used? Access. Package? Access for sure. Okay. And yeah, you certainly could. It, it really just depends, I guess, on what you want to practice, what elements of database, um, database design and where you kind of want to take it. Right. Um, just playing around with the basic idea of sticking something in a database, doing something like that, categorizing and kind of basically building an inventory management system is essentially what you did there. Yep. Um, it's certainly straightforward. So Michael, uh, what, what is a relational database as compared to a flat? Uh, it is a database that has, it defines um, essentially key relationships between tables and data. So if you have like a, um, a database of books, you might have a database of authors as well. Right. So what you would have is a table of books. So in that case, just titles, and then a table of authors. And every, and in that case, you would, every book would have a relationship to an author. So a book has an author. And you therefore could have another database uh, that was topically arranged. Well, it would be, you know, so at that, that point it's, another table in that case. So you okay. might have another table that was genre. Right. And that's where it gets more complex because if you're doing with something simple like that, you could say a book has a author and an author can have many books. And so you get this concept of how, what the type of relationship between the two are. Um, and that that's, that's really important when you're dealing with relational databases, but you can start asking questions at that point. You can say, show me all of the books by this author. You know? Right. So if somebody wanted to learn how to use and program and, and configure databases, you have a recommendation, what's a good one to start with? Access is pretty simple, to be honest. I mean, it's very accessible. Do you know any that are, um dare I say it, shareware or freeware? Oh, uh, yes, there's tons of open source ones. It, it just starts to get a little more complex because they are um, server-based. Uh -huh. So you're gonna be dealing with things like MySQL, Mari, DB, Postgre, uh, SQL. These are all open source incredibly powerful databases, but they don't have pretty gooey front ends. You're going to be doing everything through writing SQL commands and um, command lines. Now there are not, there are some nice gooey front ends. Um, there's the MySQL workbench, which can interface with a MySQL database. Um, and that's free, that's free Windows. And I think they have a Mac version as well. Um, that can be worth playing with if you want to dig a little bit deeper. But if you're at that point, it might be worth just digging in and kind of following some tutorials on how to set up like a to-do app or web application or something like that, and getting into the scripting side of it as well. That's a good idea. I like yeah. That. 
All right, so this so that's the D-base side. Yeah, you know, playing around with a, the hardest part about databases is understanding the data you want to store. That 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 is you can the the SQL and all that stuff will make your eyes um, go cross eyed at the beginning, but um, that is honestly the easy part. It's the right. it's understanding the relations, understanding all that stuff. So yeah, if you take college level courses uh, on a database, it's not how to use Access. It starts out with three weeks of database theory. Uh, and oh then yeah. You yeah, you sit there and talk about data normalization and building out diagrams and mapping of your data and, you know, we're just first and second and third level normalization and all this learning. stuff. I'm sorry, what? We're just looking for day-to-day -day practical hands-on learning. For yeah. yeah, access is going to be the easiest. Um, yeah. And then uh, if you want, otherwise, you know, if you want to get adventurous, install MySQL, install Postgre <laughs> and, and play. While we while you were coming in, another question came up that again was right up your alley uh, from TK at time mark two twelve, uh, having trouble installing sys internals on the newest PowerShell, can't use the install package name sys internals. The error says can't find the package. So he obviously wants to install sys internals, use PowerShell, and use the installer. And it sounds like it's either doesn't have an installable package or he doesn't have the name right? Well, it, I think it's a little of both. I'm not familiar. Like Sys Internals is more of kind of a brand name of utilities from Microsoft stuff. So I don't know of any singular package called Sys Internals. Um, the install package, I think, is actually for PowerShell um, modules and commandlets. Uh, not for general um, programs. Um, there is a new one for Windows called WinGet, W-I-N-G-E-T. It's kind of like AppGet, but for Windows, they just released it. Um, I think you need to install that separately. Um, worth looking into. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. Now I'm going to copy paste this one and take that as a research question if you're in on uh, Friday for the Friday Pi Day, we'll have it for that. And if not, uh, I'll pass it off to Mike for uh, Wednesday to answer for you on his Wednesday show. Okay, sounds great. Thanks, Michael. Oh, no problem. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, right. I appreciate you popping in, saying yeah. hi to the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, we got to get a little caught up here, huh? Yeah, we do. All right, I'll see you guys a little later. All right, yeah. thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Elbow question. What would you suggest for a semi-budget UPS? Good brand, model, and price. Well, there's only two brands as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Trip Light, number two, and APC, American Power Conversion, number one. Just pony up for an APC. Sorry. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're both good quality. And, you know, get the ones the right size for you and buy it. Yeah, that, that's, one of those, that's one of those things that just... You, you, you know, save up the little extra money you need to, to get the right one. But yeah, very much, very much needed and get a good one. Tolowit is speaking Hawaiian to Andre what? de Goyert. <laughs> Actually, one of the nice things is, you know, the Nordic languages, the Germanic languages are so close that when you read them, you can probably get about a 70% cross comprehension. So I know what you're saying there. Oh, Chaco Taco, please. We don't want to disparage anybody, no matter. Yeah, we have we have we have a couple of people from Spain who are on our program regularly. Yeah. Um, and you know, they're as nice as everybody else out there. Yeah. And I, I had I had once I switched from Spanish to Catalan when I was in Catalonia, it was a hundred 180 diff degree different. I mean, it was night and day. I just picked up a little book on, <coughs> on Catalan and started using Catalan instead of Spanish. And it was like, <laughs> suddenly everybody was happy. Yeah, so, yeah. you know. What's really weird is in the office, he speaks Cathillian. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. Cindy's <laughs> uh, throwing this out to everybody, I think. Mike has kind of talked about this, but we've decided that 
long and short, we don't have the expertise here. Has anyone tried to find a job for a company in Europe, specifically Italy or Canada, while living in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. So to- those of you who are in, well, of course, that wouldn't work, right? Those of you who are in Europe, can you talk about this? You know, no, because you're not in the U.S. <laughs> so, yeah. If anybody has some good answers for Cindy on that one, go ahead and post in the, in the live stream, please. Elbow, I am this close to buying a pie. I literally don't have a reason. What? You're breathing. That's the reason. They exist. Ah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> While yeah, you were, Andre really posted this while you were talking about the micro center run with Amy. Yeah. And I started laughing in the middle of your conversation. You kind of, you looked at me like, why are you laughing at me? <laughs> I was responding to Andre's comment at 216. Uh-huh. Right? Right? Being the pie guy is why Dave had to buy. You bought three new pies? I bought three new pies. The price was Dave, right. One for you, one for the Amy, and one for on me. on sale for 20 bucks, I would have bought three cars. <laughs> Wait, wait, you missed my, you missed my, my joke. I did. One for you, one for Amy, and one for me? Right. <laughs> yeah, I've got some Pi Zeros lying around. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, happy to share. Next, you're going to be saying, you, here, have a beer, and you're going to hand me a Michelob. Yeah, well, I still, we, I need to get a trip down to your house for this guy. True, true. <laughs> Hold that closer to the camera. Stays on my desk, so everybody, or, so I always remember it. Here, we're not going to say anything about it until we hear from the old timers who recognize this and chip in, and then we'll add our two cents. Because I know Tullowit is going to know this, and a couple of the other uh, seasoned members of the crowd here. I'll say it for those people who never heard of it. This is Doc Savage. Don't go look it up on the internet. We know you can do that. The question is, who knows about Doc Savage right now before Google? <laughs> Elbow already responded saying no clue. So there you go. He's a new timer. A new timer. I like that. Brendan, yeah. Brendan's like, so your wife is like mine, where she says no more toys, but you can negotiate your way to an understanding. To a degree like that. It mean if I get a toy, she's gonna get a toy. We keep things even. Excellent. Can you use an external video card on a pie? Nope. Yeah, no, now, that said, yes, they have made some toys that hook into the, uh, let's whip one of these out. That's a zero. There's one. Into the, the general purpose I.O. ports. Um, but I have never seen a, a commercial one uh, since the early days. So, no, it's not a common thing. If you've got dual HDMI, uh, that's an old card. It's just got a single one. Um, you know, the, the, it's not a high performance video card in there and I've never seen a high performance one made that you might use for gaming. So, you know, if there's one out there, I'm not aware of it. Doesn't mean it's not out there. <clears throat> yes. Got to go back and rewatch pie related sessions. Um, I'm going to talk to Scott this week. Uh, I have been indexing every one of uh, all of the AMAs that Mike has done, that Scott and I have done, and that I've done for Pi. Uh, and I kind of work on both ends of the candle. Uh, as soon as I get done with this one tonight, I'll index this one, which means everything since uh, the first Pi is all done. And then from the very first AMA up to about half of them, they're all done. So we've got all the Pi ones documented. It's time to start talking uh, with Scott about how we're going to make that available to folks so you can look up what we talked about, what we did, and all that stuff. Right. Right. And easy. You can also, uh, you know, put us on double speed so you can like make the make the snappy repartee even snappier (laughs) and go by more quickly and get onto the serious stuff. That's right. That's right. So uh, Debbie asks at 219, when is Mike coming back? What are you saying, Debbie? (laughs) <laughs> not love us is that is that no yeah, sorry i wasn't gonna add right through the to heart it. man right through the heart no mike mike will be back on wednesday he is traveling from denver uh where he is doing the last hugs and kisses with his grandkids um and is making the long trek from denver to houston over the next day or day and a half or so and he should be back for the live stream on wednesday so we're all looking very much forward to that and we listening to his to uh stories of his Trials, travels, and travails. 
<laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Word salad. And yes, we, Dave and I do have a, a good time with this. Uh, and, you know, we have, we have a lot of fun. We, our offices are, are right next to each other at, at, at our regular office. So getting to come into a virtual setting where we get to banter back and forth and argue and do the stuff that we do uh, is a lot of fun for us. We're passionate about our, our technology. We're passionate about teaching. And that just rolls into our passion about, obviously, iOS is totally superior to Android. <laughs> There's just no question. Yeah, no one would ever dispute that or, or even have a discussion about it. <laughs> There's no holy war here. <laughs> so I see a lot of banter back and forth going through about 224 about secure terms and IoT. Yeah. So moving on then, 224. I'll go mention Deepak's name is Transplant Health. Yes. So. Oh, okay. The other one. All right. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Hutz, can I use a Pi as a dedicated server to host a website? I'm building as part of a full stack web dev course. It's for medieval history research. Yes. We'll both answer this. <clears throat> uh, I do for SCA and we'll be coding portfolio. Answer is absolutely. Cannot tell you how many full LAMP servers that I've got running. They've got SQL servers and uh, PHP and all of the other stuff and static servers. Uh, Pies are just great for that. And if you're talking about, you know, only a, a couple dozen or a couple hundred people accessing it, uh, 3B is absolutely fine for that one. So yeah, piece of cake, really piece of cake. Uh, we did in second episode, maybe even, for, yeah, I think it was second episode, but maybe first, uh, how to install a web server. I haven't done how to install a LAMP server, but there's two ways to do it and they're really simple. One is you just sudo apt install Apache 2 and then you do the same thing for the three other components for LAMP. Uh, and LAMP is the interactive server that uh, includes a connection and support for SQL databases. And then so the other think? one, there is a, an, a package that's all ready to go. that has got all of the elements. I don't remember its name. It's probably something akin to LAMP. So sudo apt install lamp or whatever that package name is. I'll look that one up and, and get that for you. And so boom, you, got it. do you think you could uh, make a note of that and maybe bring it up on Friday maybe when we sure. yeah, cause back into the pie? Because I'm, I'm curious about that as well. Install, but we can start it and then go and talk about other things while it installs in the background. Okay, cool. Okay. That could be fun. The notepad. Keep going. Yeah, see, everybody but you loves IoT stuff. <laughs> it's true. I love IoT stuff. I just don't like Big Brother. <clears throat> Big Brother likes you. Well, yeah. Calling like me all the time. <laughs> and Kit, nice to see you again, our friend. I want yeah, to do CISSP. More power to you, man. That's good. Yeah. Do we have a, a course? I don't think we do. We do not. We have yeah. questions. We have a total total tester practice tests in CISSP, um, but we do not have a course yet. Uh, that's a, that's the holy grail of security certifications. When you get your CISSP, you're done, you're set. You're making six figures, you're rocking, you're rocking it all. So yeah, that is a very admirable goal. Yeah, start with CYSA. I mean, after the basic trifecta, after SEC plus. Yep. And then go from there. Yep. Uh, elbow is, <laughs> Picking on me, I can live with that. Central box can be a pie with Home Assistant. Yes, so that's one of the things I'm going to talk about briefly today. Okay. Phone already so listens to everything. Catch up on questions. Andrew, why not? <laughs> okay, Taylor. I think that's the okay. You, you know, you're going to put me on my little soapbox here. That's the insidious creep of it all. You know, somebody's got a little information. I don't care if they get a little bit more, and and it just grows and grows and grows and slippery slope argument and all that. That's where I'm at with it. For IoT's best solution, Scott, can you order any IoT in Flash and open source firmware Google Tasmoda? Holy Hannah. Tasmoda? I've not heard of that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with Tasmoda at all. You can order any IoT. I, I, I would find that amazing that any IoT device, like a ring, would work with uh, any open source thing. But I'm going to write this no. down. Guess what color my pen is? <laughs> it's the only color pen you have, if I understand right. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm going to log that one too. We'll we'll do that as a, a joint research project. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jal. We'll we will definitely look into that. Oh, so it's with, with one setup you can lose one drive on each side, and with the other you can lose one pair of drives. On that's right. Yeah. I think that another good database product that's not particularly difficult from Anthony Colson. Colson, uh, I, I have used it. I'm not good with it, but uh, you might. at 234, what is the actual difference between fault tolerance and redundancy? Both appear to be the same thing. Are they the same thing? No. They're not the same thing, yeah. but they're closely related. Scott has this theory that there's no such thing as a synonym, a true honest to God, 100%, this equals that, and that equals this. Uh, and that's one of those cases. Fault tolerance, other way around, redundancy is one method of implementing fault tolerance. So right. all redundance are fault tolerance, but not all fault tolerance are redundant. Um, now I'm trying to think of examples of fault tolerance that doesn't use redundancy. Anybody feel free to throw something in. I, I don't have anything off the top of my head, but I know as soon as I stop thinking about this, I'll look around the room and say, oh, heck, there's nine things. Okay. Well, here's, here's, a, here's a very obvious example. Okay. Um, well, it seems obvious to me. Uh, Zoom. Zoom is incredibly fault tolerant. So for example... I hosted a Zoom call last night for about 40 people. And when I logged in and all, all these people are in and life is great, I'm hosting, right? My connection dropped. I logged back into the connection and the session was still going. The fault tolerance was built in by the Zoom server, not by my client connection. So there was a, an aspect of fault tolerance to that. It's kind of a macro example, but. Yeah, that's a good, good one. Nice. I don't know what I'm is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Redundancy is, is like when we have uh, rollover uh, drives when, or hot spares, that kind of thing where you have a drive dies in a RAID array and you have a hot spare that the firmware actually picks up this Dot drive just died. I'm going to take it out of service, rebuild the array on the fly with the, the hot spare that's already there. That's redundancy. Right. And there, we have lots of redundant implementations in the computer world. There's redundant power supplies. Uh, there's, uh, man, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the acronym for the protocol where you have a failover router ready to go. So one router fails, there's one ready to fall into its place, and it even will pick up the same IP address. It starts a hot swap something protocol. Oh, HSRP, hot swap router protocol. There you go. Yeah. Excellent, well done. See, that NAT brain is still there. <laughs> it's got a couple of synapses. It's selective. Andre <laughs> de Goyer uh, thinks, is thinking, maybe I could get beer in Saudi Arabia now since we also have non-alcoholic beer. Yes, you could get non-alcoholic stuff there. You could get uh, pork-like products, no actual pork. Uh, one quickie story about it, one and a half. One, there were lots of folks on the compound that I lived on, lots. There were some uh, who made their own alcohol. Uh, you could usually find them because we usually had uh, two to three explosions per year on the compound. Uh, people who just didn't have quite the right equipment for that. Uh, a lot of my compatriots would attempt to make wine or things like that. So when they would come back from... Uh, an out of country trip, they would bring back uh, bread yeast. So <laughs> yeast up some fill in the blank. Bread uh, yeast. I'm going to let the other story go. We'll just go with that. Bread yeast, really? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. That's one way to, do, <laughs> one way to try to do it. Yeah. Uh, there's an acronym, I don't know, uh, 239 from TK, W A L A, Walla Mike. That's a, a texty sounding them thing. I don't know. I don't know. TK, okay. you'll have to explain what that means. Yeah. Cindy, following up on, uh, I guess this was from, from last oh, week. Oh, yeah, right. We talked about this on Wednesday last week. Yeah, on Wednesday. So, yeah. Disabled Hibernate and the hyper file .sys file went away. Good job. Excellent. Solved. Six gigs free. Yep. And for anybody who has that, remember, 
when your system hibernates, it takes a snapshot of the entire contents of your RAM. So the more RAM you have, the bigger that file is going to be. So mine, mine would be 32 gigabytes. That's right. <clears throat> yeah. That wasn't a RAM size thing. I mean, if you were on for James Stanger, you'd know that we're all just sized <laughs> out completely. It's like what, what 128 gigabytes of RAM in his system? Yes. Crazy. Yeah, that was incredible. Yeah. Uh, Andre's got a question for you. Uh, he's asking it to Michael, but or, yeah, you get it. So Michael does the questions, but who does the Sims? It was a joke. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. You know, I, I didn't see the multiple crying, <laughs> laughing emojis. Yes. So this, the Sims, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the products, uh, CompTIA does performance-based questions for A+, Network+, Plus, Security+, Plus, where you don't have to answer multiple choice questions. Instead, you are doing something like configuring a wireless access point, for example, or typing in a uh, command line thing where you need to know the actual commands and be able to, to type it in correctly with the proper syntax. So these kind of things where you're doing stuff, we once they introduce these kind of questions, we're like, ah, we need to have some tool to be able to prepare our students for dealing with this stuff. And so we came up with the Total Sims simulations, which are essentially mirroring or mocking or trying to be like um, the performance-based questions. And they come in, they come in for a set of four types. Um, there are shows, which are essentially uh, voiceover uh, motion capture. Right, so it's me or Dave uh, or Shannon talking about how to get from point A to point B to accomplish something in Windows or Mac OS, okay? So that's a show. Then we have what are called clicks, which are essentially the same kind of thing, only instead of us walking you through the steps using our voice, the simulation just waits and says, you need to click on this, or where do you go from here? And you click, and if you don't get, click correctly, it pops up and says, no, no, you need to click up here to the corner or over there to the you know, side or, or click this button here. And it walks you through that same, same simulation, but you're doing the work. And this, again, stepping you up into the performance-based questions. Uh, Michael, so uh, various people develop those. Um, as I mentioned, Dave, Dave and I and, and Shannon and several others are the narrators for the shows. Um, the clicks are done with a whole bunch of people doing it because it's a bunch of different programs that, that make it happen. And the type, Michael Smyer, who was on here briefly, uh, actually created an entire sandbox that mimics the uh, Windows command shell like the full thing. So you can type DIR and IP config and uh, all of that stuff and non-destructively be able to play in this sandbox. So he developed and he developed those, he developed the engine behind those simulations and the, the rest of us wrote the actual simulations themselves. And then we finally have what are called challenges, which are puzzles and games and, and things where you are required to do stuff, uh, matching things and uh, various in-house and out-of-house developers put those together using gaming software, using uh, modeling mm, software, 3D blending. Yeah, so a whole bunch of different, whole, the, whole bunch of different things. I know what Andre was really asking is when I'm going to finish these Security Plus. <laughs> <laughs> to but which my Andre, I'm working on it. <laughs> right. What you get from this presentation, Andre, is proof that Scott is day-to-day -day in it. He knows this stuff off the top of his head, knows knows the, the four to and there's a fifth type it's it's called read which is just pdfs that have instructions and right. things like that right i forgot about those yeah right. absolutely so yeah. debbie strauch uh, <laughs> was thinking that when we talk about michael smyer and mike myers that that might have been an interplay on names of the same person so no michael smyer is a real independent person uh just an amazing guy the the, the degree of respect that i have for his knowledge and his skills when it comes to this stuff is amazing. Yeah, for a while in our in our uh, office, we had uh, 
there was me, Scott Jernigan. Well, there was Michael Myers and Michael Smyre. There was Ford Pearson and Scott Ford and Scott Jernigan. Aaron? <laughs> yeah, so we had like all these all these kind of crazy, where's the time it's like, I'm sorry, we can't hire you because you don't have one of the names. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we even had David Biggs and David Rush. I mean, yeah, Biggs was before my time. Never knew him. Oh, that's too bad. Yep. Good guy. Also, SDA. Too many good things. Andre, hey, where's his headphones? Yeah, I think he he uh, definitely uses AirPods. Michael is a serious, serious Mac Apple fanboy. I mean, I make jokes about iOS. Michael lives. <laughs> but he pretends to be open-minded when we talk about android stuff <laughs> <laughs> but would he ever actually own ever it? own one you can see him washing his hands and using sanitizer after you touch mine <laughs> once <laughs> so and just i i assume you guys all have varying degrees of of fun in your mobile devices uh dave and mike myers are definitely in the Android camp. They have multiple Android devices. They use Android-based phones. Um, they they enjoy the wilder, more accessible aspects of the Android ecosystem. Uh, Michael and I are serious iOS people, um, mainly because we like our hands being held and no playing outside the box and you know i don't get sand outside <laughs> all in i draw my crayons in the lines in the lines and yet he's amazingly creative all <laughs> of the creative things come through him or most of them and uh, his input and his direction it's a it's an interesting diversification so andre's in your camp dave just in case okay as, as well he belongs <laughs> TK, you keep throwing out these one words that I I'm, I'm, can't always discern. So pocket. Oh, where, where he's got his headphones. Oh, okay, okay. We're still talking. Okay, I got it. I, I was actually reading it in real time there you while go. you were talking. So or while good. Michael was talking. <laughs> All right, a bunch of tools for troubleshooting. Yes. Okay. And that would be uh, when we're talking about sys internals. Right. Yeah, sys internals. Um, Michael just touched on it. If you're not familiar with sys internals, um, you should be. This is not on a on, not on a plus, not on net plus. I don't no, think not in any of them. But we yeah, use but, them in many of our presentations to illustrate points. Right. So a guy named Mark Rusinovich years ago, just on his own, developed these tools for helping make Windows better. And he called them sys internals. Uh, and everybody who was like a major troubleshooter of Windows and stuff just said, holy smoke, this is the, these are the tools that Microsoft should have had. And Microsoft finally tossed in the towel and bought his company. Uh, so, yeah. Right. So, so, like his big one, Process Explorer. Yeah, these are many, many great, other. great wow. tools. Look them up. Yep. Yeah, you, will, you, will, you will learn to love them, especially as a network person. Okay. Hey, I knew I could count on Tolowit. 252, and we're catching up a little bit. Yep. Uh, new, the Doc Savage comics. So Doc Savage is a mortal, normal human. He's not normal. He's a human without superpowers, but he's super smart and he's super strong and a, a force for good with his crew. Uh, lots of pulpy books from the 60s and 70s, is that about right? Yeah. And Scott has how many Doc Savage books? I've got, I think I have about 80. <laughs> I so was, was somewhat of a fanatic. For every buy I buy, you get a Doc Savage book. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was somewhat of a fanatic when I was younger. Uh, Robeson. One movie, right? No, there was no movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the movie was, the movie was, pre-CGI, pre-decent special effects. It was like the first Captain America movie. Again, just <laughs> <laughs> don't even go there because it just doesn't work. I, I would like actually to see a Doc Savage movie now. Yeah, they're so good at movie making with that kind of stuff. Yeah, that that could that? definitely be cool. 
great topics and, and they can crank out a crappy movie sometimes. Yeah. Uh, Debbie Strauch knows it. John F. Uh, gets deeper. The artist, James Bama. Yep. Bama. Very cool. There you go. Oh, oh, my scrolling just jumped. Where okay, were we? I'm, I'm caught up here. I'm at 252. Okay. More from Tullowit. Old school pulp fiction. There you go. Yep. Tip. <laughs> we got Doc Savage followers in our company in Total Seminars. I don't know if Mike does, but to my knowledge, the only two of us that have ever recognized Doc Savage are looking at you right now. So, yeah, that was kind of surprising. Yeah. Yeah. He's very much up the geek line. Yeah. So Cindy, Cindy, you're welcome. Okay. It was that was nice that Michael was available to jump in. Yes. That was that was cool. Yeah. Well, he's always around and he's always here to, to do the shutdown for us. So I figured he'd be reachable. But yeah, he's 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 normally uh he spends he spends this two hours coding. Yes, he does. And just ignoring us completely <laughs> and knows that we won't interrupt him while he's coding. So he has <laughs> a two hour, beautiful two hour block. <laughs> uh Cindy's following up at 254. Thanks for the info about DBs. Yep. I'm studying for MTA SQL Fundamental. SQL Express is free but limited. I work with MySQL, but the, the whole DB world is fascinating and overwhelming. Everybody's got a niche. Um, if, if you're looking in the camera right here, um, you will not find anyone who finds databases fascinating. To me, it's a workaday tool and hopefully it gets installed correctly and it has all the stuff that it needs and I can add to it like my, my own cloud servers. But as, as far as the guts of what's going on inside. I'm overwhelmed by it, so I'm not fascinated just because I don't think I understand it. Yeah. When I had to had to do the database, introduction to databases is part of IT fundamentals of, of all things. And so uh, Michael and I sat down and spent about a week on, we have one, we have many whiteboards, but we have one gigantic, like 24 foot whiteboard. And we just sat there with this whiteboard and he took me on baby steps through all of the different things of programming. And it, it all boils down to what kind of questions do you want to answer, right? And you need to know all those questions before you start doing the database. So the, the prep work for doing database programming uh, or, or development is phenomenal because you need to get it right. So yeah, it was fascinating stuff. Yeah, oh well, good. But yeah, definitely a very different field than uh, gaming. <laughs> <laughs> B Rush my is here. B Rush, you hold a special place in my heart because my son is B Rush. So I always jump on that. That's Will true. VPN encrypt devices with unsupported or outdated OS versions? So there's a big confusion uh, in VPNs when we talk about the, the kind of VPN that CompTIA cares about and the kind of VPN that everybody in the world uses. Uh, so let's make sure we're, we're clarifying something, the difference here. The VPN that we deal with and talk about on a day-to-day -day basis in the world of CompTIA is a box at your home or home network called a, a VPN concentrator or a VPN server. And it is effectively a tool that knows how to encrypt and decrypt a data stream. And then when you are out of your home network, you're in the hotel, you're in the lobby of the business you're visiting. Mike always used the example, you're in the airport. It's always Denver airport, so okay. Um, what you do is you turn on the VPN client in your computer and you call to the public IP address of your home network and this, that says, oh, okay, I see you're doing VPNing. Let me get you in contact here with the VPN box. And then the connection will be established between the two of you and it will be secure, it will be encrypted. From there then, it works just like somebody had plugged in a, a cable to your switch inside your network and ran it from wherever your network is to your computer. You will have a direct personal, they call it a tunneled connection because it's encrypted and unhackable. And uh, there've been some, actually there was a report of a, a big hack recently. Uh, it was a big release of a master key, but 
so that's the, the kind of VPN that we talk about here. And they also use VPNs to establish connections like that over the internet from this network to that network. I've got a corporate facility that's got a headquarters and a bunch of satellite headquarters. So we can establish VPN connections between all of those folks. The VPN that everybody day to day understands is this box that lives out in the cloud somewhere that exists to hide your identity, your IP address from an end site. So there is a, a video server in pick your favorite country. Wakanda is in the news this week, right? So I got a video server in Wakanda. Uh, and that server is programmed that whenever it sees an IP address from the United States, it says, I get too much traffic from there. I'm not talking to you. Your connection is denied. So some folks out there have set up a, a, an intermediary box that they call a VPN, a virtual private network, that you connect to with your US address. And it, in turn, using whatever address it has that's approved for contacting Wakanda, will go to the Wakanda site, get the streaming video, send it to here, translate it back into your IP address, and send it out. So there's the two VPNs that exist in the world. So now let's see if we can do something with your question. Will VPN encrypt devices with unsupported, outdated OS versions? I think the answer to that is yes. It's just a data stream. So as long as you've got an appropriate VPN client and host on either side, they don't care what OS you're running, how old it is, as long as you've got the, the appropriate VPN support software. Right. That's where I'd go as well. <laughs> Andre's, <laughs> yes. Andre, I'm <laughs> answering for Scott. Uh, you win something. The satisfaction knowing that you got the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> you win a round of applause. I did. Uh, <laughs> and ECC, uh, not sure where we're going with that. ECC is found in servers. It's not in PIs. PIs use non-buffered, non-ECC DDR4. Uh, I, Andre was talking about um, uh, fault tolerant. Oh, okay. Sure. That's a heck of an idea. Yeah. And it's not redundant. Right. Brilliant. Yep. Very good. So at 305, Jason asks, hey, Dave Rush, I watched some of the Raspberry session, Raspberry Pi session. I'm seeing prices from 60 on up to like 120. I'm guessing he's talking dollars. Yeah. What's the difference between two and four gigabytes of RAM? Okay. So yeah, I don't know if you're talking about US dollars or whatever, but I can tell you right here, uh, there's the price tag on it. This is the regular sales price for a two gig model at Micro Center. Walk in the door and you pay $35 for this box or cough up 20 more bucks. There's the price tag right on it, 55 bucks for a four gig model. Okay. So now of course you gotta spend a couple extra bucks. You need a case, you need a power supply, you need a micro SD card. Right. That's about everything else you need. Everything else you other uh, needs uh, you already have in the house. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what's the difference between two gig and four gig of RAM? It's the same as what's the difference between having this much RAM or twice this much RAM in a Windows machine. So the more RAM that you have, the more is available for the programs to expand and to cache things. Uh, so again, I set up a, a Plex server this week, this weekend uh, with two gigs as opposed to one gig. Now there's a lot of other differences between that and the other pie that I'm using, but holy smokes, what a nice difference. So yeah. if, if I got the money, I'm buying more gigs of RAM. 120, you gotta be looking at kits with prices like those. And there's nothing wrong with those. Right, can never have enough RAM says Tolowit. Hey, Bernie Schroff, nice to see you, bud. Zoom. Ugh. Like, so yeah, the, the Mike does invent characters. <laughs> Watched his videos, you, you, you know, Mike Stromy, and he puts on his little silly hat and does his magic stuff. And yeah, so he, he will, he will, he will definitely, there's a lot of people inside Mike's head just desperately trying to get out, and they sometimes come out on video. So, <laughs> uh, Tolowit at 309. Yeah. We're not too far behind. We're catching up. Uh, are there security vulnerabilities for a smartphone while just on the cell network? Can someone spoof a cell tower like a man in the middle attack? 
Absolutely. There's a name for stingers, right? So law enforcement agency uses a box called a stinger. It's a portable tower, fits in a, a small case. Uh, and they use that when they are trying to intercept calls from someone and, you know, do all uh, purportedly the, uh, the appropriate stuff. They only record uh, the call, the connection from their target. But yeah, if they walk in the middle of Times Square and they set that stinger down, uh, that's going to allow all the cell phones in proximity to stop connecting to the towers that are farther out there and to connect to this box. Um, I have never seen a report that it has been used by anyone other than law enforcement, but I would imagine that would be a pretty well-kept secret if it was. Yeah. Yeah, they exist. You're, you're vulnerable. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we, we, um, we teach a lot of government agency classes and every once in a while there'll be some, some question will come up and I'll be like, well, yeah, what, what kind of things can you guys do with this stuff? And they're like, yeah, stone cold <laughs> silence, <laughs> stone cold silence, pretty much what it is. Yeah. Andre says to both of us, maybe someday they'll find a cure for people that like that fruit stuff. Wait a minute. Scott is among the people who like the fruit stuff. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> See, Debbie, I would I would go the precise opposite. That Apple is so drop dead simple that anybody can use it. Whereas Android, because it differs from device to device, that it's overly complex and and confusing as as all get out. So I I'm lost on Android stuff. It drives me crazy. Yeah, it's a get well, used to kind of thing. Both of them. Yeah. 313, Andre de Sys internals is great. So many great tools to fix, tune, improve, troubleshoot. Absolutely. You, you, we are fanboys of all things Sys internals. Yep, very much so. <laughs> nice back and forth between Andre and Telewit there. Yeah, I'm seeing that. If you have 120 gigs, but if your mobile only supports 64 gigs. Um, yeah, here, let me give you a, a, the aviation line. There are only three, uh, three things that you, that you can have too much of. Uh, too much fuel when you're on fire. <laughs> uh, it, it, it works backward. Too much altitude when you're out of fuel and you got time to glide. And there's a third one I forgot. It's been a while since I've flown. <laughs> no, there is no such thing as too much RAM. If you got a motherboard that only supports 64 gig and you got 128 installed, later you're right. going to get a, a motherboard that's got 128. So right. it ain't too much. It's just too much today. Yeah, when we were uh, last year, we were. Um... My son and I were upgrading his uh, desktop computer for school. <laughs> you know, it, of course, it's for gaming. But um, <laughs> we ended up there were he had four slots on the motherboard. I we stuck in uh, four four two eight gig and two four gig RAM sticks, and twelve gigab gigabytes of RAM showed up. Huh. That was it. No matter what combination we used, wow. 12 is, is max. And it turned out it was it was literally the motherboard. That's all it supported. We flashed the BIOS. We did all that stuff. Uh, how you would normally hope to uh, extend the life of a motherboard. It was finally to do what we always do with old and obsolete computer gear out the window yeah. by a new one. So that's I have it. an Intel, I don't know how to pronounce it, NUC, Nuke, uh, whatever the little four by four board is nuke uh, intel yeah, nuke. yeah. Uh, and it's just got an i an, an old i i uh i3 core i3 in it yeah and it had eight gigs in it and i said you know it's time to upgrade this thing so i picked up a, a pair of eights and plugged them in and it wouldn't even boot and then and i looked at the specs eight is max eight is max deal with it wow so jean jean dorival Hey, you're not is. too late. You're here. The show's not over. So, hey, Jean Dorval, I got your email and, and I think I answered it. Uh, the cool thing about your avatar is it's the only one of that color. You've got this really nice, interesting blue. Get rid of it. I want to see an avatar from you. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Scott. <laughs> so, that's plenty of time for you, Jean, since it's only 3 30, uh, to ask questions. Yeah, go and I've got it. my three to. to Answer in just a moment. Anything else we're yeah, missing? We're just here? about caught up. Okay. So.
So we can we can get to the questions that came in over over the weekend. Right. So Andre, no, I didn't get an eight gig. I didn't even ask because um, I don't have a good enough trade present for the misses. Uh, the eight gig is at least seventy five bucks. <laughs> Uh, that's a lot of dinners out, man. <laughs> Lots of flowers. I don't know if, if Amy is even a flower person. I'll tell you a story about that someday. Okay. Offline. <laughs> All right. Now, here's the quickie. We're married for a few months uh, making peanuts and working at very low-paying jobs in New Jersey. Fairly expensive place to, to live. Yeah. And one day... I stopped and bought flowers and took them to her office. Now, Amy is an accountant and, and has always been, even when she wasn't. She chewed my neck off. We don't have that kind of money. <laughs> so the next time I got her flowers was when the son was born. <laughs> wow. So, so what, that way it had to be. Uh, so Jason's filling in here. Uh, okay. Should have clarified a bit. Yes, I'm looking at Raspberry Pi and the can of kits is what I'm looking at for fourth generation Pi, most current versions. Yeah, so that's not unreasonable uh, to expect 60 to 120 bucks for the whole kit. It's a fair price. It, right. If you're tech savvy, uh, what I did with these is I bought the Pies and I bought micro SD cards. And then I went online and built my own kit. I bought power supplies and cases uh, and a couple of other goodies. And I bought them from China. So in the end, the kit cost me 10 bucks, another five bucks for a card, and then whatever the sale price was on these. So 10, 15, and 30, 45 bucks to create the same kit as you can get from Canna Kit. I never throw away old computers. I disassemble them for parts, dismantle them for parts. Okay. I yep. disassemble them and use them for targets. And tell what at 328, uh, Dave answered your question uh, much earlier. So yeah. yes Basically, no. not that I'm aware of. No no external cards, video right. cards for pies. All right, I'm going to hit a couple of questions that have been posted and otherwise, and we'll see where Hold we're on, let me, let's, let's at least say that, hi to Alice, too. She just showed up. Oh, Alice, Alice is here. Alice. Excellent. Oh, Alice. Good to see you. Is Chow like shalom a greeting and a, a departure i think it is she will let us know i'm sure okay i was asking you but yeah the good chance she'll know <laughs> <laughs> I, she right, so a couple say, questions got posted in various uh forums that, that we've been doing amas and pies and so we're going to hit a couple of these uh falak who i haven't seen today so we'll be brief falak if you're here say hi so uh, Falak had, uh, was reading the Mike's Sec Plus book and found something on page 332. I'm going to read this to you and another one on page 337. He says, Leap uses dynamic web keys and provides for mutual authentication. Shouldn't it be WAP key? And we think he meant WPA key. In web key, web keys are static and WPA keys are dynamic. And then there was a follow-up question. He says, uh, from a different page, issues involved with small initialization vectors, small key sizes, and static key repetition. WEP is not suitable for use in modern wireless networks, and that's why he thought WEP has a static key. WEP does have a static initialization, but it has a rotating initialization vector. It's very small, and it doesn't take too much traffic before it can uh, rotate and repeat. But that's not the point here. The point was all about using Leap to make some of these unsecure protocols more secure and more dynamic. So we, Scott and I talked about this. Scott did the research. Of course, he did a good deal of writing on the book. And what I've got here, what I wrote down from our, our follow-up conversation, you can correct me or fix me or expound on it. Uh, this is, uh, if you're thinking that web keys are static and WPA are dynamic, but that's not the point of the text, the description of Leap in the Security Plus book is accurate. Accurate Web keys are static, but Leap changes keys every time it authenticates. Thus, the description of Leap using dynamic web keys is correct. So there's a couple of pieces of information that kind of looked like they were in conflict with each other, but not so much. How bad did I butcher that, Scott? That was right on the money. Woohoo! I think I might have copied you. Uh, Ajake, 
who I haven't seen in here yet today. Are you serious? You don't think I can hit a CPU at 25 yards? Please. I could do that with a 22. Uh, does Raspberry Pi support local volume management? I'm going to answer this one again on Pi Day Friday. Uh, but for those of you familiar, uh, local volume management is a component within SANS, storage area networks, and absolutely uh, RPI fully supports uh, in various SAN configurations with iSCSI and uh, ButterFS, totally supports logical volume management version two. Man, I didn't copy paste who wrote this question. Maybe you, Scott, will remember. Uh, RasPi is a home server. Is that Brendan, Brandon, somebody else? I don't remember. Yeah, me too. Uh, nonetheless, so I did a lot of chewing on home servers and pies. And what I found is kind of like what we talked about earlier. There's multiple interpretations as to what the heck a home server is. So if you could just go out and generally look up Raspberry Pi home server, you're going to find instances of various software-based servers like web servers and database servers and mail servers and things like that, which are really cool to have at your home uh, and be able to access them from outside your home. I want to send an email and I want to use my own email server. I can do that with the appropriate setup. I want to access information. I want uh, my family members to access information that I post regularly, uh, having a website at the house. Uh, but I don't think that's what we're talking about. What we're talking about is what we sort of talked about at the beginning of today, having a box that runs your home-based IoT stuff. <clears throat> so my lights, my doorbell ringer, my whatever. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of packages and courses out there that teach you how to do that. And what I'm finding is depending on how much stuff you're asking it to do, there's a variety of opinion as to whether or not uh, even a, a good new two gig, can't see myself, I've got my monitor covered because I'm looking at notes, uh, Raz Pi, if that's got the horsepower to run a well sort of filled house and you include the alarm stuff and the sensors and things like that, maybe there's better choices. However, uh, one of the guys, uh, former guys in our office, he was, uh, what was Brian's job? He did everything. He was, he was our production. video production director. Yeah, send me in charge of production somewhere in there. Uh, so Brian has built out of a pie and the fours weren't out yet. We did it with a 3B plus, uh, a home server setup where he used it to control his lights and monitor his open doors, uh, control and monitor his garage door, uh, so there is a home server out there, a home assistant for this thing. I'll mention it all in uh, Pi Day Friday. I'll put up some links for tools to do that. But either of the two interpretations, full support. Nice. Thank you. You're getting there. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll give you one now. Uh, if you look... If you look at a, uh, an educational site called Plural Site, one word, S-I-G-H-T, uh, and look up uh, Raspberry Pi home, uh, server home, home server, there's a really good course in there. Their courses aren't free, but their introductory courses are. So I did the introductory lesson for that thing and said, yeah, if I were going to take a class on how to do this, this is definitely one of my category. So PluralSite.com. Look up, in fact, here's the, here's the whole thing. You'll hear it verbally and you can pause this and type it in on your own machine when you look at it in the archive. It's www.pluralsite.com slash courses slash raspberry dash pi dash server dash home. I can put that up, Scott. Oh, okay. oh no, I can't. It's a website. Oops, <laughs> and it makes noise. <laughs> Uh, my thing popped while we were doing that. Flower beds. Right, yeah, so we're I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I'm back where Alice checked in. 3.29. We've got uh, 20 minutes to go. We should be all right. Yep. Tell what your avatar is, in fact, quite unique. I have never figured out what it is. To me, it just looks like three color swoops. But I'm sure if that blew up or if I blew it up on a screen, I'd be able to interpret something more. But that's the way I see it. So it's okay. Well, there you go. 
Hey, way to go. Jean Doraval's thinking about it. Very good. There's flowers in the park. Oh, God. I, I didn't look at the name. I saw that. I was thinking we were going to do another Mine is in the Cloud with Grandma. You got to sing that again for two more days. <laughs> Thanks, ex-friend. Let's <laughs> go another place. Get the eight gig. <laughs> okay, I got it. Get out of my flower bed. <laughs> you know, I, part of, part of the, the joy of of doing these AMAs is is the back and forth and the the stuff that's not the technical stuff, but just you know, chatting and making jokes with friends. So absolutely, always Keep always good. Sipping adult beverages while we do this. <laughs> Alice, as a real nerd, Alice, are you a real nerd? We'll see. I would like better to receive a chip of ram than flowers. To which just a, a little bit later, <laughs> Tellowit answers. I, I'm skipping over a couple of things. Yeah. A okay. bouquet of DDR4 and dark red. I saw that you as I was say, playing when it's lit. Tellowit, you say the sweetest things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tellowit was also one who came up with tasty ram. So, <laughs> <did what he's laughs> so, uh, I'm glad the, a lot of the a lot of the comments and questions between now and the end of the feed are based on Alan's question at three thirty two. Is it compulsory to update the BIOS of your PC? Super good because that was the one I was going to hit. Go okay. ahead, you start. So, and I, I w have been reading the feed as as people are like, don't don't do it unless you have a, a compelling need to do it, and that absolutely is the traditional wisdom. Uh, but as at least one or two people noticed or noted in the feed, the BIOS, flashing the BIOS these days with newer systems is not that scary. Right. It's done online, it's automatic, it's the tools are built into the UEFI uh, firmware. I do. Um, let me give you an example of, of why I had to. This, this summer, we built a uh, game machine for my son and used a nice Ryzen 3600 plus or 3600X uh, processor. It was beautiful, picked it up for a song and it's like this mass, beautiful, beautiful thing with a brand new Asus motherboard, worked like a charm out of the box. So I was doing some research and I had a year and a half old or a two year old Asus motherboard. So the, the previous model to what we got from my son. Same socket. And I'm like, well, the 3600X looks pretty sweet. I wonder if it'll work in my system, right? And it turns out that yes and no. If you put it in straight up, the answer is no, you'd get a brick. Um, but if you flash the BIOS and got the support for the later CPUs, then you could put in the new CPU and it would work. So that was a compelling reason to update my BIOS. Until then, I hadn't because my system was stable. But when I first got the system, I definitely updated the BIOS to make it have the latest firmware for that time. I figured if I bricked it at the very beginning, it would be OK. I'd just take it back and say, hey, it was broken <laughs> or something unethical like that. Um, <laughs> But there's usually there's usually a 15 day or two week warranty on the thing anyway, so there was no no real fear of doing it fresh out of the box. So, but then later on, because the system was stable, I, I saw no need to update the BIOS until there was. That's my answer to start with. Yeah, and that is part of the standard wisdom. If you leave your BIOS alone until you need to upgrade it to add support, or maybe there's a new BIOS out that. Uh, fixes a security hole or something like that. Right. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. Once a year, I set aside a, a couple hours a day for two weeks and I update everything. I update every driver in my system. I update every flashable BIOS. Wow. One day it'll okay. burn me, but in all of these years, it, it hasn't yet. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there you have it. Hey, iOS Jake, is I'll clearly superior. To Android. <laughs> now, there's only one correct interpretation. <laughs> uh, Jason has scheduled A plus core for the 18th. So cool. Just over two weeks. We are very much looking forward to hearing the results. And if anything we can do to help you before then, sweet. 
I buzzed. Go, <laughs> go find. Now <laughs> with a black powder handgun. No, no, I can hit big trees with that black powder handgun if I'm ten feet away. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Alan in Telewood read a lot of Okay, that's all. He's talking about the size of his monitor. Yeah, I got that. Just saying. <laughs> you know, I, I think Telewood and, and Alice have this a, a geek romance gift site. Loving that. I think that'd be I think that'd be great. Yep. Especially now that thinkgeek.com is out of business. Yeah. There's this <laughs> that would be that would be important. Yeah, yeah. that generated a lot of good feedback. Yeah, very much so. It's been a nice thread. I <laughs> know I'm judging you, Telewit. I'm totally judging you by the size of your mouth. <laughs> and Andre, you're exactly right. If you brick one, it, it's tougher to brick these days because it's done as a two-stage process. The BIOS file gets copied into one flash drive. Uh, so if that gets interrupted, big deal. It, it's just a staging, a buffer flash drive. And when it fully goes in there, then the transfer is just from one flash to the regular real BIOS chips. So a lot tougher to brick a system. But if they do, uh, there are from the manufacturer and from third parties, you can get replacement chips with the current BIOS. Just pop out the old one, pop in the new one. It's a little eight pin chip. You can take it out with your pinky finger. I know that because in a class I did one time with uh, one of the Fed agencies we did, we were talking about BIOSes and things like that. And at the end of class, one of our clever guys popped out the BIOS chip and reversed it and plugged it back in. So when it came time to bring that computer to life, it gagged. And as always, we have spares and I use that and send it back to the office and we troubleshot over the phone and somebody put their finger on it one time and it was really, 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 really hot. Hey, I think I got an idea. <laughs> That's that's deliberately malicious, though, not just. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and that was the kind of guy. Somewhere. Oh, okay. I see what you did, Tullowit. You know, I remember you mentioning that a while back. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I love visiting the Washington Monument. That's just a fun place. Yeah, I finally, I finally ponied up since we're talking about monitors. Um, I, I finally ponied up for a third twenty-seven inch monitor. Nice. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this monitor is the only monitor I have right now in house that's got a VGA uh, that has an HDMI connector on it. Yeah, I had another one and it bit the dust a couple weeks ago. So we went down to Micro Center this weekend to get pies. And while I was there, I picked up just a little 21 inch HDMI so I could hook it up for the pies instead of disconnect this from my day to day user and then the machine doing this and plug in over there and bleh, so. Hey, we're getting there. How are we doing here? 12 minutes. <laughs> Just before we shut down the office, I bought a pair of 27 inch 2K monitors uh, and I needed a new video card and then we bailed out of the office. So they're still sitting there in a box in boxes. Wow. I know really should bring them here, but Uh, Judah Wande Alu uh, was asking about SIS internals. I think he missed our discussion early on, if you want to take that. Sure. SIS internals is a um, series of programs developed by a guy named Mark Rusinovich uh, years ago uh, that are stunning tools for diagnosing um, troubleshooting Windows systems. So uh, Process Explorer being one of the ones that we fall back on a lot because mm -hmm. if you if you go into um, task manager and you look at you can see all the tasks and things that are running on a windows system that's all well and good but if you really want to know everything that's happening in that's like live real time the only tool that's going to give you all that information is process explorer and like like Process Explorer, the other SIS internals tools, these are downloadable from Microsoft. If you haven't had a chance to play with them, they're not on any CompTIA exam. But I guarantee you, every serious professional in IT uses these tools. So yeah. it's definitely worth your time. 
Disinternals.com, I, I would think, right? Let me take a I think you just get it from the Microsoft store. Can somebody check? I'm going to look at SysInternals.com just okay. so it's there. Okay. Windows SysInternals. It takes you to Microsoft Docs. So, yeah, you need to get it from the store or from the app, app package installer we were talking about earlier that we don't know about. <laughs> so it's at 346. Wow, what time is it? It's getting close. Wow. 50. We got 10 minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. The time flew today. Yeah, but we're only four minutes behind, so we're all right. Okay. So, um, Jean is taking Net Plus on Friday. Good luck. Uh, any tips? Uh, in the immortal words of Mike Myers, don't study on Friday. <laughs> Just chill before your exam. Uh, I tend to be, especially with, with Net Plus, I tend to be a last second crammer of things like port numbers and protocols and that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just rote memorization. So having that sort of like going through your flashcards or your notes on those particular things, um, that's a good thing to do the morning of the exam. Anything else, anything deeper than that, I would, I would stay away from. But make sure you've, you've got till Friday, it's only Monday. So spend some time going through your notes, which I assume you took. Um, probably not enough time to rewatch and retain video information, but notes are a good way to kind of skim through, uh, skim through your book, check the chapters, look at your highlights, that kind of stuff, and, and then have a good night's sleep and just rock it. And then tell us on Friday, assuming your test is before the AMA, uh, mm -hmm. tell us how you did or tell us on, on Monday, if not. So good luck. Um, one thing I would add if you're for as a particular thing of study, the last time I took a, a net plus, we take them all fairly regularly so we can sort of keep an eye on what CompT is asking. I got five questions that were all effectively the same skill. And that's that question that says uh, a company wants to uh, break up its network into five sub networks with them at least 22 nodes per network. And here's the network address, and it's a class here, whatever. Make sure that you can do that. And you know, you're going to have a little notepad or a, a scratch pad to write on. Uh, it's an electronic whiteboard. But again, I have five of those questions. So it, it's a skill that they do. Now, you may get zero. It's, it's a random pool that they generate. Right. But I guarantee you'll get one, if not more. Tolwit, yeah, you're, uh, same thing, Tolwit. All of the uh, modern machines tend to have dual BIOSes, so you can have different versions in them or keep a backup of one and the other. Oh, Alice, pray. <laughs> I'm a believer in the power, power of prayer, but <laughs> that's the advice you're gonna give them, huh? <laughs> tell, so I, my, my, tell what asking for like one of my 24 inch monitors that I, I rejected that yeah. my, my, my lovely young wife does not like all the crap that I have laying around. And so she's often saying, Oh, are you done with this? Let's donate it to charity. <laughs> so mm -hmm. a lot of times stuff doesn't stay that long. So when I've replaced it, there's only so much desk space in a, in a in our old house. Um, so things like that tend to go away pretty fast. Jason, how long does it take to flash a BIOS? Just curious. Typically two to three minutes. Your mileage may vary, but. Oh, you're at 349, okay. Yes, I'm sorry, 349. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> I love the, the SCA and, and other trebuchet challenge shows where you have to, to hit a target that's, you know, an eight foot tall, 10 foot wide wall. They can usually hit those. I want to see you hit a CPU from 50 yards. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was a, yeah, trebuchet is remar remarkably non precise. Lightsabers. Uh, so much of it. 350, Jean de Raval. Which is better, RDS or VNC? Can I connect onto a computer not on my network with RDS uh, like you can with TeamViewer? Yes. Um, RDS has one benefit that's remote access, remote, uh, remote, blah, blah, blah. I assume you're talking about the Microsoft 
port 3389 remote access. Otherwise, if there's a third party, I, party product, I don't know. Uh, Microsoft 3389 remote access does not encrypt. So if you're going to use it, um, you might want to have to, to run it over SSH or something like that. VNC encrypts, but it has one downside. Well, real VNC. Uh, there's, there's a dozen different VNCs out there. So you're going to have to pick and, and study the specs. So I'm, I'm but, guessing though that he means RDP, right? Yeah, remote desktop protocol. Right, OK. Yeah, 43389. Uh, so VNC does encrypt. RDP does not. Real VNC that we use on the Pies doesn't transport audio. That sucks. RDP does. Yeah. So, and you'll have to look it up. And again, there's some other VNCs out there. Type VNC, Mike and I like. Uh, and I haven't played with most of the other ones, but they all use the same port, 5900, 5901. Yeah. And I, I use TeamViewer a lot. And Me it's too. remarkably easy to use. Michael, who does our systems at the office, hates it. <laughs> it's it's individual users doing things on individual machines and he can't control it. Right. Right. Which from a from a site uh, uh, the what am I trying to come up with? The domain administrator standpoint, you know, he's he's has to think in terms of the entire system that so having something that he can control from a centralized location, like a VPN, is far superior in his case than those of us who do individual connection to our work machines via TeamViewer. Yeah. So hopefully he's not listening right now. <laughs> hey, we're running short on time. I'm going to zip through okay. a couple questions and answers. Okay. I was asking about sticking a, uh, a Ryzen 7 and a Ryzen 5 MOBO. The answer is probably, but the answer, uh, what you have to do to find out is just go to the support site of your motherboard, uh, check their supported CPUs, and you'll probably need a specific, at least this version of BIOS. But they all use the same socket, all the, the, all the Ryzen 3, 7s, 5s. Michael is listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome. <laughs> Yes, Trevor Kreitz, there are firewall questions, uh, performance-based and multiple guess questions on SEC plus exam. Yes, and, and a little bit later, he says class and classless CIDR. Yep. So yeah, uh, although yeah, classless not as much. Right. Yeah, not as much in SEC plus because that's mostly beat up in net plus. Right, right. Jason Helms, I'm either lucky or stupid because I had an update on BIOS and it finished successfully, neither. It, it is normal to be successful, even when it was dangerous. Right, right, that's true, that's true. Uh, all the years that I've been doing updates and stuff, I think I've bricked one device out yeah. of hundreds. Uh, and that, bricked, that was because the power went out. Yeah, that, that would be the normal reason. Doug yeah. bricked a whole bunch of, uh, of our Cisco little Soho routers yeah. before I joined the company because he skipped a step. It, it, it worked great on all the machines that were new out of the box, but all the ones that had been configured, you needed to do a, a, a 30, 30, 30, and he didn't do it and they all bricked. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you pop up our, um, pop yeah. up our contact information? Gotcha. We yeah, we'll start winding things down here. Yeah, because we're, we're running, running towards the end of this could be the... This could be it. It could be it. Mike, is gonna, Mike is coming back on Wednesday. He should be right here with his shiny, happy face. Uh, so we're all looking forward to that. Uh, if you want to, if you have questions for Mike or Dave or me, uh, here's our contact information. Uh, the easiest way to get a hold of us is, is through is via email. So Mike is Michael M at totalsim.com. Dave is Dave R at totalsim.com, and I'm Scott J at totalsim.com. So easy enough to get a hold of us. You can also call if you need to at 281-922-4166. Uh, our answering people will answer the phone, um, and the phone call will eventually get to us. It's not going to go directly to us uh, immediately. Um, and Alice, I, I think. I think it'll just be Mike, but we'll see. The specials for Wednesday and today are still the same. Um, the AMA specials for this entire week are 50% off on all the A, A plus and net plus super bundles. 
uh, and the Security Plus Video and Total Tester Bundle. So the super bundles are videos, total tester practice tests, and the simulations, which we have for A Plus and Net Plus. We don't have the simulations done yet for Security Plus. Uh, We're so this close. Just the video and total tester bundle for that. So just use the code MMLive831 at checkout at totalsim.com and get a great deal off of these awesome practice uh, tools. Process. There you go. Cool. Uh, my cool. last thing, and then we'll buy. Um, remember, everybody, this is, uh, what's today? Today's Wednesday. So Mike is on Wednesday. Uh, if he does his feature, it's a really cool one. He may still be uh, coming down from the trip, and maybe he'll just talk. We'll see how it goes. I uh, hope to see you here on Friday for Friday Pi Day. We're going to complete the uh, media server series. We're going to integrate Cody and Plex. It's cool. It's easy. And I got neat things. And of course, I got some other cool stuff. I got a good Wireshark lab for us with DNS. So be thinking about the port number that DNS uses. Okay. Till Wednesday, till Friday. Scott and Dave signing off. Bye. Take care,